We've had a great run so far. This show has been incredible in so many ways. And by my personal rating system, we've had 11 episodes in a row enter the three fedora category. No easy feat by any means. I love this show. I want to make that clear, so that when I begin to pick this tale apart, you'll know that I'm doing it because I have no other choice. This is tough love, is what it is. This is a bad episode, is what it is. Andrea's log, game data unknown. We've entered a new system with the hope of finding mainframe. Once again, we're met with failure. With each passing system, Matrix grows more despondent. And I fear if we don't find Mainframe soon, he'll give up all hope of ever finding home. Andrea out. Power lock, get in front, head them off! Where No Sprite Has Gone Before was written by DC Fontana, with story by Gavin Blair, Phil Mitchell, Dan DiDio, and Ian Pearson. The main cast includes Paul Dobson as Matrix, Sharon Alexander as Andrea, Ian James Corlett as Robert Carcer and Email, Michael Donovan as Cold Boot and a Spectral, Michael Dobson as Power Lock, David Kay as the Head Spectral, Andrew Cavadas as a Spectral, Terrell Rothery as Pixel and Feline, and Venus Terzo as Giga Girl and Copy Girl. Where do I begin? Two minutes in and it's already fallen apart. In case you've somehow missed Star Trek in pop culture, this episode, right down to the title, is a Star Trek parody. And you need to know something. I love Star Trek. But just... Well, you saw the clip. She voice records things? Huh? Matrix was standing right there. That was so clearly put in for no other reason than to have a Trek reference. <sighs> okay, I'm two minutes in and I'm already nitpicking. Let's push forward. Those colourful characters are members of the Hero Selective. So we're getting a bit of a comic book parody as well. The members are chasing a pair of glowing balls that basically resemble moving tears. The visuals here are okay, but nothing mind-blowing. One of the characters, Email, is basically Mr. Fantastic, so he turns into a net and captures them. But the real draw of this intro is that the leader of the group is named Robert Carcer, aka Bob. And yeah, he looks a lot like him. What's poor Matrix to think? Could this be Bob? Tensions rise as the trio meet this group, but Cursor releases the tension. You're not one of us, are you? No, we're not. Well then, allow me to introduce myself. I am Captain Robert Cursor, leader of the Hero Selective. I'm Matrix. Andrea and I used the last game to enter your system. Then you're to blame! No one is to play the games. The user must win! Only then will the Spectrals listen. Why would you want to lose? Don't you know the damage it'll cause? <laughs> Don't speak to me of things you know nothing about. So yeah, Carcer is doing the long pauses of Captain Kirk. But like full-blown parody Kirk. I have watched every original series episode and film. And yeah, he has some weird intonations, but he never did that. I know they did this gag already, but that was a one-line gag. This is a full character. Also, hmm, I wonder if the mean-looking guy who has been an arsehole is a bad guy or something. Carcer invites the trio back into their HQ, and instead of refusing and staying around to investigate, or running a system scan with glitch, or anything, Matrix just says, sure, and follows along. Andrea and Frisket literally shrug. Great, even the characters in the narrative don't know why they're there. We scene shift to what I meant is a pretty cool secret base with some bat key vibes. Huge computer consoles line the room, along with random monitors, a holding cell tube, and a bar. Netboy drops the glowing balls in the containment tube, and Cursor and the others start talking about who they are and what they do. The orbs are spectrals. 
And they also used to be spectrals, but were turned into sprites. And just listen to the monologue here. We volunteered. Our mission was to seek out new game cubes and new applications. We boldly went where no spectral had gone before. That was five cycles ago. Now we want to go back. Liar! You were seduced by the flesh and rejected your spectral state. The games have turned you into barbarians. You no longer belong in the spectral selective. But we've grown tired of the games and want to return. No. Your format is to defend the system from games. Anything else is a waste of resources and a threat to our existence. The dialogue is just atrocious. I've stopped mentioning it because it gets redundant, but the dialogue in this show is usually so crisp and sharp. Here it's so forced. I realize they're introducing a new concept and so they need to have exposition. That's not a huge deal. Here is the huge deal. What are spectrals? Where do they come from? Why are all the Dentians of this system spectrals? Do they just happen to start hunting them today? Don't think about it too hard. They get as much love as the Codemasters. That is to say, none. When Power Lock, the buff one who chomps on a cigar, threatens the spectrals with deletion, Andrea pulls out her trident and defends them. Okay. I mean, she's a good person, I get that. But why is she so invested all of a sudden? This isn't a collapsing system desperately in need of a savior. It's very clearly an internal problem that, quite frankly, they have no business dealing with. Well, there's no real urgency. Cursor breaks the tension again and takes Matrix and his Justice League knockoffs over to the bar, which is run by a Scottish Iceman. And after a few moments of nothing, one of the superheroes notice that the Spectrals are gone. Andrea let them go because no one deserves to be in a cage. Okay. The hero selected run off to get them back, and Matrix talks to her. Why'd you do it? I wasn't ready to take sides. But Bob said... Cursor. You meant to say Cursor said. <sighs> and so, look, I admit there's a resemblance, but Cursor's not Bob. Bob was lost in the web. Who knows how it could have changed him? Bob wouldn't stop the Spectrals from protecting the system. I thought you weren't taking sides. I wasn't. Until now. Then why don't you go to them? Maybe I will. I find this place stifling. Fine! Fine! Now, granted, this idea is okay. Matrix defends Cursor because he reminds him of Bob. Reminds him. That should have been where it stopped. It's so clearly not Bob. The similarities in appearance and Matrix being fooled is such a contrived coincidence that shows that the writer has never watched an episode of this show. And they argued over what? Spectrals? Huh? What if the two glowing balls were like serial killers or something? Again, why do they care so much? It's dumb, but on the other hand, it's the only real contribution either of them really makes to the story. More on that later. Andrea nicks off, and we see her on a street meeting up with a few other Spectrals. They tell her to piss off, and she says no, and they agree to let her help them do... something. I'm just trying to survive to the end, okay? The Selective return, and Matrix mockingly comments on their failed hunt. So now he's antagonizing them? What's happening? One of the consoles comes to life reporting a system error. I have no emotional attachment to anything that's happening. I'm glad you think this is funny, but if this place goes down, you go with it. And that includes your little witch. <laughs> your problems end now. Stop it! Stop it! We mustn't fight amongst ourselves. Why don't you just mend the tear? Not in this form. Then in which one? Guardian? No. Spectral. Still nothing. Andrea and the Spectrals, which sounds a bit like a pop band, heads to the system's principal office. Andrea gets down to business trying to get to the root of the system error, when suddenly a bunch of tears pop up across the city. One of the Spectrals starts going nuts! and talks about how Andrea tricked them into gaining their trust so she could destroy the system. The Spectral flies into a rage and eventually takes off. Okay. Andrea traces the source of the problem back to one tear, and asks to be taken there. Meanwhile, 
Carcer asks Matrix why he keeps calling him Guardian. And Enzo says he reminds him of someone, and blah blah blah. Eventually, Matrix does a scan of the system, which he should have done right away, and discovers there are viruses in the system. We flash back to Andrea and the Spectral Leader for one of the worst dialogue exchanges ever recorded. Andrea, you are not from our system. Why do you wish to help us? Preserving life and preserving systems. It's what Matrix and I do best. It's our... Prime Directive. But you and Matrix are no longer together. What will you do next? Oh, we've been through a lot worse. Love and respect, that's what binds us, and with it, nothing will ever keep us apart. You shame me. The anger I feel towards my former brothers, it's not right. Hatred and prejudice never is. Were they holding a gun to the actress while they spoke? This is some of the worst dialogue I've ever heard. It's stiff, robotic, and has literally no bearing on what is happening. Hate and prejudice? What are they talking about? The plot thus far has been Marvel knockoffs chasing glowing Christmas decorations. They arrive at this huge terror, and the spectrals mend it. Apparently that's their function. Cool. Really don't care. Then, Andrea literally pulls out a tricorner from the original series out of nowhere and scans the area. <sighs> I get it, Miss Fontana. You wrote for Star Trek. Stop ruining my favorite animated series. Her readings indicate that the terrors were artificially created. The crazy yelling spectral blames her and the other sprites, and a few spectrals attack her. She eventually gets them to calm down, and explains that someone is sabotaging them. Matrix and the Loser Patrol arrive, and each group claims the other has a virus. Oh, and Power Lock isn't there, so he's clearly the virus. Like, duh. I mean, who could the virus be? I have no idea. Am I Mr. Fantastic or what? No, oh, you're surrounded. Sorry, but you've got to do better than that. Your claws are useless against our energy shields. Eventually, Carcer and the Head Spectral decide to call a truce to deal with the viruses. Everyone just immediately stops fighting. That was easy. Good thing Matrix and Andrea were there to do nothing of any particular importance. To the surprise of literally no one watching this, the crazy yellow Spectral turns out to also be a virus. And the Ice Guy freezes him so he can't, uh, do whatever they were going to do. They all rush back to the principal office, and yeah, power locks the other virus. Friskin attacks him because of his viral sixth sense. Power lock walks over to a giant button that says, do not press, and says if he presses it, the whole system goes offline. Excuse me for a second. The hand special rushes him. Matrix, watch out! It ends. Now! Okay, so the whole point was that they were viruses masquerading as whatever to destroy the system or something. They got downloaded into the system with the first game. Okay, sure. Whatever. Why did they wait until now to enact their plan? Why would they destroy the system anyways? Viruses usually want to conquer things. Why was there any conflict when, at the end of it all, everyone is actually quite reasonable and calm? Sadly, Carcer dies from his injury saving Matrix. He's mourned for five seconds. The Spectrals and the Selective agree to work in peace from now on because the episode is running out of time and Matrix and Andrea leave via a GameCube. But not before the Spectral makes one more Star Trek reference by saying peace will be established by the next generation. And I puked in my mouth a little bit. This is a train wreck. 
where do I begin? Let's bring the charges before the court here. Terrible dialogue, boring and unengaging action scenes, a whole slew of comic book stereotypes no one cares about, a talented actor forced to do a stupid Captain Kirk parody voice. But there's three things that doom this episode into irredeemability. First, the plot is nonsense. We never learn what the virus's plan was or how it could have possibly benefited them to just destroy the system. Also, the principal office had buttons. How did the Spectrals do anything? Second, the scene where Andrea and Enzo fight over people they literally met two milliseconds ago is the worst scene on this show thus far. Neither character has any reason to get invested. Speaking of which, Matrix and Andrea had no reason to be here. And besides that one scene where Andrea frees the orbs, they contribute nothing to the plot. If you can take out the main characters from a story, and the story still basically works, you have failed. Is Miss Fontana the Earl Hammer Jr. of Reboot? Maybe. Is this the worst episode of season 3? Definitely. It's a zero.